Hi everyone, I'm Jesse at strobepro.com and today I'm going to be showing you the Godox QT3 Studio Strobes. This is a replacement for the QT2, which was already one of Godox's most popular studio strobes. It was a pro level strobe with a lot of features and this new version has just taken it to a whole nother level. So let's take a closer look what this strobe is all about. Here at Strobe Pro, we'll be carrying three different versions of the Godox QT3. We have the 400 watt second, the 600, and then the 1200. Basically all of them look identical, except the 1200 watt second is just a little bit longer to fit those extra capacitors. You can tell which version you have, obviously, by the number on the side. That represents how many watt seconds that strobe is. So right here I have the 400, and then accordingly the 600 and the 1200. So you can see all three versions on the website. Let's open the box and see what's inside. I'm going to be unboxing the QT3 400 watt second version. The 600 and the 1200 watt second have the identical parts inside. So it doesn't matter which version you're gonna get everything that I show you right here. So when I open the box right on the top, we have our power cable with the Velcro strap, which is nice if you need to pack it away again. Then we have our manual. You're not going to need this because I'm going to go through absolutely everything to do with this strobe. Um, if I pop this out, the styrofoam, set that to the side, we have our actual light itself. And this is secured really nicely in there so it's not going to bang around. So there's our light. Let's set that over here. And then in the bottom, don't miss these, uh, you're going to have a pack of spare fuses. There's two extra fuses in there, chances are you'll never need them, but they are there just in case. And then an important thing to remember is this box right here. This is not just packing material, there's actually something inside there. So if we slide that out, right here. We have our glass protective cover inside. There's a foam layer on the top, so just remove that. And then inside you'll see that foam piece. Now there is another slot there that's actually for the flash tube. So if you do have uh, a reason that you need to store that flash tube or ship it or whatever, you can put it in the foam there as well. Uh, but for our purposes, that's already installed in the light and we're just grabbing the protection cover here. So that's all the pieces in the box. Let's take a look at how to install them now. We're ready to install our glass protection cover. And to do that, we need to remove this plastic cover on the front. Now we've had a lot of people in the past that have actually melted these thinking that they're snoots or something. So please, the first thing you need to do is remove this whenever this gets powered on, even for a few seconds, you have to make sure that this cover is taken off. And it's done really easily, just like a modifier, which I'll show you later, but there's a release switch right here. Pull that back, give it a quarter turn, and it's going to come right off. It's a Bowens mount, so it goes on just as easy. Line those up, turn it, click it in, and we're good to go. But I can't stress enough that needs to be removed. It is not a snoot or some type of modifier. Um, from here, we have the glass protection dome and that needs to get installed over the flash tube. This just helps protect your flash tube. And there's three little prongs here and we want to just grab them kind of down below with that. So you'll get the two and then the top one, you might need to just use your finger, push it in a tiny bit, they're spring mounted and then you can snap it into place. You wanna make sure that it's seated all the way around. You heard that click in there. Um, so if you have that flush, then we are good to go. Let's take a look at a few of the physical changes on this body compared to the previous version. Right away, you're gonna notice that the actual housing is completely redesigned. So this is a full new body. You're gonna see a new handle here. It's got this orange on it. Uh, it's rubberized on the back, which is really nice. It's still a full metal body, but it's actually a narrower diameter than the previous version. So that's kind of nice. It saves you some space. On the bottom, you're also going to notice a brand new mount here. And this is the same mount that's on like our 8600 Pro and our 8400 Pro. So it's a really popular mount, um, stepless design. So it slides in and out really easily easy to lock down and tons of grip strength there. 
The other thing you're going to notice immediately is the front here. There is no modeling lamp anymore. And that's because one of the big upgrades to this light is its 40 watt LED modeling lamp. So that's really nice because this is actually more powerful than the previous version. And the previous version had a 150 watt uh, incandescent bulb in there. So you don't have to worry about breaking bulbs or anything anymore. This modeling lamp is designed to run for over 50,000 hours. So you're not going to have to be changing that at all. A couple of the other design changes, there's a lot more venting in this because the modeling lamp from the LED does generate some heat. We need to get rid of that. So we have a fan port cooling in the back there, as well as in the side of the Bowens mount. And then of course on the bottom and up on the front right here. So lots of cooling to keep this operating in peak temperatures. Now we're going to mount the light and it's really easy to do. You can see over here, we have this handle. So I'm just going to loosen that handle. The actual bracket will drop down and then just tighten that back into place. We have a thumb screw right here and this will fit to any standard stand. So any strobe pro stand or any other light stand, you just have to either have a baby pin, which we're going to use here on our nine foot HD. Or if you just have like a regular stand, I would recommend minimum a nine foot stand for this. Uh, the seven, just when you get modifiers on this can become a little bit more unstable. And we're just going to back off the thumb screw and drop it into place. Now you'll see there's two holes here. If you have a unique stand where this screw is not going to hit the spigot, you can actually remove it and put it in another slot if you want there. But because we're using a strobe pro stand, we have a flat side on here. And that flat side happens to be over here on the spigot. So I'm just going to loosen that, turn it around, drop that right into place, tighten it down. And then we can adjust the tilt again, put it wherever we want. From there, we're ready to install the power cable. And I just wanted to mention about those fuses really quick. In the back here, right, above the plug-in area, that's the fuse location. So if you ever do happen to blow a fuse for whatever reason, use a flat bladed screwdriver. There's just a little area right underneath. You can pop that and there's a little tray that'll slide out and you can switch the fuses. But to plug this in really easy, make sure we have our protective cap off so we're not gonna melt anything. We just take our power cable, really easy, straight in the back. Now we're ready to plug it in and turn the light on. Now I'm going to show you how to mount a modifier. I've grabbed a seven inch reflector here, which is probably the most basic modifier you would use with this light, but a softbox or anything else with a Bowens mount installs just the same way. I do wanna mention that this reflector is sold separately. So you saw I didn't mention it, that it came with it. The one that you want to pick is the reflector that also fits the original AD600BM or the MS300. The previous reflector for this, for the QT and the QS lights, does not actually fit this light. Now, it will fit it, but the umbrella mount slot is different. Because we have a new mount here, that's all changed. So we wanna make sure you pick up this reflector and that'll be indicated on the website, uh, which is compatible with this. So you can see this little indent. I don't have the umbrella slot punched out yet but I want to make sure that that lines up with the umbrella slot on the bottom, which is just down here. So we go and line up our Bowens three prong just to the three prongs on here. And if you can't see it, you're just gonna rotate it around. Once it's in there flush, give it a quarter turn and now it's locked in place. So if we were using an umbrella with this, we would obviously punch that little metal piece out. The umbrella goes into the reflector and then into the mount and you can adjust it that way. So make sure you pick up that seven inch reflector. You're not always gonna use it, but it is handy to have. It also fits our seven inch uh, grid set as well, our honeycomb grid set and our barn door set as well. So it might be a nice piece to have in your kit. To remove any modifier, it's just as easy as installing it. We have this release switch over here. So you wanna make sure that you have a grip on the modifier. Obviously I'm using a small reflector here, but if you had a big 60 inch Octobox or something, you wanna make sure that you have a solid grip because you don't wanna drop it and break that protective glass. All we do, pull that switch back, it's spring mounted, give it a quarter turn the other way, just like that protective cap we installed before, and then it just pulls straight out. So really easy to remove. 
We're ready to turn on the power now and go through all the functions of the strobe. The power switch is just back here. So if we flip that on, we're going to see a bunch of numbers and that beep telling us that we're ready to go. So let's just go over a few things. We have a number of different modes. We'll start with the one here by default. Uh, wireless is turned on by default because more than likely you're going to be using this with the Godox controller and I'll show you how to set that up in a second. But if you're not, you can switch to another mode and use a PC sync cable if we need to, to trigger it. In its most basic function here, the knob on the right controls our power. And you can tell right away that it's super annoying to have that really loud beep on every time I turn power because you don't want to be on set and be doing that every time you turn it. So to disable that beep, it's really easy right here push that little sound button. Now when we adjust the power, you can hear that it's not going to beep. Um, right away you're going to see that this is flashing. This is in our color stability mode right now, which maintains uh, plus or minus 200 degrees across the entire range. So if you're trying to be uh, quite color sensitive to what you're shooting, then you will need to dump that power. Normally you would do it just on the trigger, but this is just letting you know that we went from a higher power to a lower power. So we need to push that to dump it to be accurate. Um, the mode or sorry, the button on the other side here is going to control our modeling lamp, but we don't have that on. So it's not doing anything right now. So let's turn on the modeling lamp, which is right over here. So if we push it once, all of a sudden you're going to see that it shows 50% there and we can actually control this all the way up to 100. And again, we've got that new LED modeling lamp in there, which is quite powerful, which is nice. And then we can go all the way down to 1% actually. So we can really fine tune that. And if I go any further, you're going to see it doesn't go to off we would need to push the button here to switch to either proportional or off. So let's talk about proportional here. What proportional means is as I increase the power of the actual strobe here, that's going to increase the power of the modeling lamp. So you can see on the background back here, as I increase that, the modeling lamp is getting brighter and brighter. Now, normally that has no effect on your actual shot that you're shooting. Um, unless maybe if you were using, you know, at 100% or something, the flash is always going to overpower that uh, modeling lamp. Now, there is one other way to control that modeling lamp. And if I switch the mode again, I can click this button or this dial, I should say, and we can switch modes that way. It'll just turn it off or on. Same thing if I change to the percentage mode here and I set a percentage mode, then I can click it off or on with the button and just control the modeling lamp that way. Um, there is a function in the custom settings, which we'll talk about in a minute, where we can uh, either have that modeling lamp stay on when we fire the flash tube, or we can have it turn off. This thing recycles so fast, though, you'll probably never notice that. Um, moving on here, so we've got our modeling lamp. I'm just gonna turn that off for right now, actually. So we've got it off again, our power levels up, down, and you can see that this is adjustable in one tenth increments. So it's very precise. We can really fine tune that however we want. And I can just turn the dial faster if I need to go down. And again, this goes all the way down to one two fifty six power level. So we have a huge range of stops there. Um, this is going to allow you to Say if you have a 600 watt and you want to shoot a lens that's wide open at 1.8. On other strobes, you wouldn't be able to do that without like a neutral density filter or something. Because this goes down um, to 1256, you can likely shoot that at minimum powers and have those nice blurred backgrounds. For example, if you're a, a baby photographer. Again, we can dump that. And over here, we have our group and our channel. So we're going to talk about that in a minute when we connect a controller, uh, but let's just go through a couple of the other features on here. You're going to see this S1, S2 button. Now, if you're not using a controller, it's uh, another way to trigger this flash. So if I click that once, 
you're going to see S1. And up on the top here, there's a little red patch. You can't see it right now. That's the optical sensor on this light. So if I have S1 mode enabled, any other flash is going to trigger this. Now, if you are in your basement studio or just a confined space where it's just you shooting, that's probably fine to have on. But if you're taking this anywhere else, just be aware that any flash is going to trigger this and it's probably something you wanna keep off. Now, if I push that again, we're going to go to S2, and that's just a mode that's rarely used. It's, uh, it's going to trigger with the pre-flash. So if you had a camera that had red eye reduction, essentially it's going to ignore the first burst and then fire with the second one, keeping it in sync with that other flash. On the side here, there's a rubber flap, and if you kind of put your fingernail under there and pull that out, don't pull it all the way out because it is attached at the bottom you're going to see two things in there. We have our PC sync, which is a 3.5 millimeter. Uh, so if you're in a situation where you don't want to use the controller, we sell a lot to um, like production houses and that they just want to go directly into their camera with a PC sync cable, you can do that. Again, 3.5 into your camera and then you can bypass any um, other way to control it. Um, you're also gonna see a USB port right here. And please don't get that confused. That is not like a firmware update port or anything. This is a legacy um, control port here. So if you happen to be on like the XT16 from Godox, which is six or seven years old now, it's an original, but if you still have one kicking around, you can plug in a receiver and, and use it that way. I highly recommend updating that controller, but if for whatever reason you've got one kicking around, you can still use it. Godox insists on keeping that on nearly every strobe for whatever reason. So just wanted to mention those two ports on the side. And now we can switch to another mode. If I switch right here, what you've seen is that the flash duration has disappeared. So let me just go back there and explain that real quick. So here at the bottom, you see the flash duration. So if you're doing like water droplets or something that's very high speed, you can actually see that change right here as I adjust the power. So as I go higher, obviously that number is gonna get less. So the lower I go, the faster the flash duration gets. And you can see there in this mode, we can get down to 1 6200th in the high speed mode that's going to increase a lot more so i'll show you that in a second as well let me show you quickly how to connect this to a controller now the first thing that we want to do is go to our actual light here and set our group in our channel so our group is indicated over here by this a and i have this group channel button so if i click it once all of a sudden you can see that it's blinking and you'll see this is not the dial we want to use. We actually want to use this dial here. And that's going to go through all our different channels. So we can go A, B, C, D, E, F, and then it's going to go into numbers as well. Now you want to keep this on a letter um, just to make it easy with your controller. So let's just set this back to A, which was the default. If we leave it there, it's going to continue to blink and it'll eventually lock in or I can just push this button here and it'll lock it in right away. So we're on group A and that just means that, say we have three lights in our studio setup. We want two on our background and one main light. We could set our two background lights on A. That's going to mean that they're going to fire together. So as I adjust the power, they're going to go in sync with each other. And then let's say group B is our main light and we can adjust that one independently. So you can put multiple lights on a group, but just be aware they will adjust together. And it's best to put the same type of light on a group because if I have, say, a QT400 and a QT600 on the same group, even though they will, it'll show that we're at 132nd power, because those are different watt-second strobes, 132nd on a 400 is not the same as 132nd on a 600. So just group uh, like strobes together. Now going to the channel, if I press this for a couple seconds, you're going to see the channel blink there and I can just adjust the channel to whatever I want. Um, there's a ton of different channels there. So you can just cycle through them and pick whichever one that you want. 
So we'll stop at 20. Again, that'll continue to blink or I can lock it in and go from there. If you are a person who uses the IDE function that Godox has, uh, I'll show you where to adjust that in the menu. I wouldn't recommend using ID unless it's completely necessary. You have more than enough channels, you're not going to get any interference. Let's connect our controller to the light now. It's really easy to do, just like we did on the strobe itself. We need to set the group and the channel. So up here in the top left, I have my channel and I need to go, you see the group channel button over here. If I click this button underneath of it and I hold it, we get the blinking just like we had on the controller and I need to scroll down and we had set 20 on there. So we'll set 20 on here and we are connected. So I need to make sure I'm on the right group and we have these buttons on the side. So we're on group A, I'm going to click A and let me just see if I can adjust the power. You can see now it's changing. Perfect, so I know it's working. Let me hit the test button here. Yep, we know it's good to go. So it's really as easy as that. If we had other groups, again, I would just push the button here, make sure that one's on B, C, D, whatever we want. Uh, you can control multiple lights right from this controller. So again, go back, we can adjust the power and set it that way. Now there is a custom function in here and I want to show you that really quick just so it syncs up with your new light perfectly. Because this light goes all the way down to 1256 power, we need to make sure that we can match that on the controller. So if I hit the menu button here, I'm going to scroll down until I see oh, the step button there. So. By default, that can be set on 1128. That would mean that we're not going to be able to go all the way down. We want 1256, which is this power level right here. So if I get back out, go to my group, I can adjust that way. Now that's going in third stops. This light will actually go in 10th stops. So the one that we want to have, if I go into the step is actually 1256, right down here, push that, get out of the menu. And now this, oops, if I select the group, this will adjust in one tenth increments. So you can set it wherever you want. You just wanna make sure that you are on one 256. So then you can take advantage of the low power settings on this light. Again, we can test fire that off right there if we want. One other, um, quick menu thing I'll show you right here is the distance mode on this light. Sorry, I should say this controller. So we have a close range mode. So if I was using this controller actually this close to the light, you might get some interference. So we have a setting right there under distance that we can change this from zero to 30. That's just close range mode. There's a couple settings that change in there. Um, just allows to have minimal interference. So there you have it. That's really how easy it is to connect a light, set the same group and channel, and then we're ready to go. So I use the X-Pro controller here, but you might have an X2T or an X1. We have dedicated videos for all of these. Obviously, I just did a really quick overview here, but we go fully in depth on all the functions of this controller. So if you want more information on that, be sure to check out those individual videos on the website. Moving on from our standard mode here, we're going to go over to high speed sync mode. So you see a number of things change. Our flash duration on the bottom is gone, but we've gained our high speed sync indicated by that H. Now, every camera has a native sync speed. On most cameras, it's either 1 200th of a second or 1 250th of a second. And that means if I push past that with a standard studio strobe, what I'm going to get is black bars that show up either on the top or bottom on most cameras that are essentially you just taking a picture of the curtain because the flash and the camera have come out of sync. High speed sync is a way around that. This allows us to shoot up to one eight thousandth of a second. Um, we are going to require 
a specific controller. So if you shoot Sony, you need the Sony controller from Godox or Canon, Nikon, whatever it is, you just have to be brand specific to enable high speed sync. Make sure it's enabled in this mode and then also on your camera. And then as I mentioned, we can push all the way up to one eight thousandth of a second, pushing past those limits. Now you will notice when I switched over to this mode that it is one thirty second. In high speed sync, you cannot go lower than one thirty second power. You can see that I can turn that down. It will not push past. So nothing's wrong with your light. It's just you need that amount of power to be able to uh, work in high speed sync. So we can go up from there, obviously, um, from 132nd all the way up to 1 over 1. Again, adjustable in 1 tenth increments. So easy as that, switch to high speed sync mode and push past your camera sync speed. Moving on from high speed sync, I'm going to hit the mode button again. And now we are going to enter multi mode. So I'm just going to dump that so it stops blinking. This is a mode where we can take advantage of the very high speed of this flash. So if I was shooting, I always use a dancer example across a stage. What you can do is capture that dancer in one frame in all the sequence of the movement. So if she's moving across the stage doing some, I don't know what a dance term is, a pirouette or something, you can have them turning the whole rotation around and catch it in one single frame. This is not to be confused with high speed mode on your camera. That's something completely different. Um, I'll explain that in a second here. In this mode, we have our, our number of shots and our hertz. And there's a formula for basically connecting your camera shutter speed um, to these numbers here, but I'm just gonna show you how to control them. You can check out all the equations and everything how to set this properly uh, with your shutter speed in the manual. There's actually a chart that shows you. So from here, what I can do is click the button and this is going to control my Hertz. So I can adjust that all the way up to 30 Hertz if I want. I'm going to leave it say, let's, let's put it at 10 Hertz here. And if I click again, this is going to show me the number of flashes that we have. So I'm going to say I want to fire that 20 times at 10 Hertz, lock it in, and then I can adjust the power. Now this is best used at lower powers um, because we can get more flashes in there. It's going to have a bottom end, end limit. For example, if I was to go up to one over one power, let's just go back up there. You can see that it just changed the settings that I had. It's saying, no, you can't fire that many shots at that hurt level because we don't have the range for it. So again, now I can go in and adjust that. Let's go back to 20. Just to give you an example, 22, that's fine. And we want to shoot, I don't know, 12 shots. I'm going to dump that charge first. Okay, and now we're going to fire that off. And you can see that's rapidly firing that. So chances are you're probably not going to use it that fast. You'd probably be more something in the, I don't know, let's go down to five hertz. And you can see that it slows it down. Obviously, that's going to allow time for your dancer or your skier or whatever you're doing, the time to move through the frame there. Um, basically, that's all there is to multi-mode. Uh, it's best used on dark backgrounds um, to bring in your flash duration. Uh, it's just easier to see and easier to set it up if you're using multi-mode. We're going to go back to the main mode here and just go over a couple more buttons. You see this little wireless symbol on the bottom there. If I hold the mode button down, you can see that I turn my wireless off up on the top. Now, there might be a reason that you want to do that. I would just typically leave that on unless you were getting interference or something from another controller, uh, then you could turn it off. There's a combination of button pushes here, the S1 and the sound button. You can see RST. If you push them together, 
it's actually going to uh, reset the entire strobe. So just hold them together and it's gonna start beeping. It's actually really annoying because it wants you to dump and we have the sound button on. So if you reset and it's up high or something, just be sure you turn that sound button off again because it's gonna be really annoying if you don't. Once I get rid of it, um, we're good to go. Uh, let's take a look at the custom functions now by going into our last menu. Let's take a look at our custom functions. To enter that menu, we push this button here, which is the three little lines. Click it once and you're going to see whatever uh, functions so we're in function one and we have speed highlighted. This is the most important one. By default, this strobe, when you turn it on the first time, is going to be in color stability mode. So that's the mode where we have plus or minus 200 degrees Kelvin uh, across the whole range. It's not going to fluctuate from there. But we also have speed mode here. And if I go in and I can use this dial is going to switch between the different functions. This dial, when it's highlighted, will change the setting. So you see I switched it to on and then we can just click the dial and it's going to come out. Now we are in speed mode and you can see a number of things changed here. Well, actually the main thing that changed previously, this was limited down to like one. Well, let's see what it was here. Um, just turn that back on actually. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's set it there. So we were at flash duration of 16700. That's in color stability mode. When we change that, you're going to see that that changes. We'll turn it on, back out, 29,600. So we have a much shorter flash duration in the speed mode, but it comes with a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is the Kelvin temperature fluctuation. So we're going to have a separate video on testing some of the actual changes between the two modes but you are going to notice a difference at different power levels that that Kelvin can fluctuate outside the color temperature stability mode, which was plus or minus 200 degrees. So we can fluctuate all the way, you know, past a thousand degrees. So in a lot of situations, that's not going to matter if you're doing some high speed uh, shooting, but if you're shooting product photography or something, you are gonna notice it and it is going to be an issue for you. So I would suggest that probably you want to leave um, this in the color stability mode. Um, but one of the benefits of going into the speed mode is when I turn up the power, for example, and then I turn it back down, we don't have to dump the power. And that's where the kind of trade-off happens is it's not as accurate in the Kelvin, but you don't have to dump the power and it is quite a bit faster. In speed mode, this will recycle extremely fast at our lowest power setting here at 1256. This will recycle faster by far than I can push the button um, at 0 0.01 seconds. And even at full power, if I turn the beep back on here, Let's go up to full, one over one. Let's turn the beep on. It's less than a second that that's recycling. So keep that in mind. If you need to shoot some uh, something that's really high speed, you want to go into the speed mode. If you're normally using it, I would suggest just leaving it in that color stability mode. Let's get back into the menu again. And we're going to turn that beep off because I find it extremely annoying. Uh, whoops. There we go. So in the menu, we're going to go to, uh, we're gonna switch that back to our color stability mode. And now we're gonna go over to F2. This is a flash uh, delay. So you can use the dial here and set the milliseconds if you're trying to sync up uh, with the timer or something, or you need a triggering delay for whatever reason, you can set that right here. To be honest, that's, quite rarely used. So just make sure you leave that on off because if you set that accidentally, it's going to cause an issue when you're triggering uh, with your controller from your camera. Uh, on to number three here, we have our mask mode. 
And we're going to have a separate video on this. Um, we have N1 and N2. Essentially what this mode allows you to do is use a minimum of two strobes and they'll sequence um, to create a shadow or basically a mask of whatever subject you're shooting. So this can be really useful if you're trying to mask out um, products and then clip them in Photoshop after. Um, you can have that mask layer and it just makes it really easy for doing that. But more information on another video to come for that because it is very rarely used. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, going to number four here, uh, we have our modeling lamp and it's kind of hard to understand what that is, but let's, let's turn it on right now and get back out into the main menu and turn our modeling lamp on. And let's bring that all the way to 100% if you can see it there. So what's going to happen with that on is when I fire this flash, I'll put my hand here so you can kind of see it. That modeling lamp stayed on um, the entire time when that flashed. If I go into the menu and let's turn that to off, whoops, wrong button, off, get back out. Now it's going to turn the modeling lamp off for that brief second when I flash. So I'm not sure if you can see it too well, but it is actually turning that modeling lamp off. Really, it, it doesn't matter. I would probably just leave it off. Um, you don't need it to, to stay on the whole time. There's no real reason for it. Um, going back in, we can go to number five now. And this is having to do with the ID on our controller. So you heard me mention before when we were setting up our controller that there is the option to use ID. Normally we have 32 channels, but if you happen to need more, this will go all the way up to 99. And some people like using the ID if you're at a wedding and just by some chance someone else has a controller. Um, you can create basically infinite number of combinations between um, using this ID with your controller. Normally I'd recommend leaving that off. A lot of people set this and then forget and then wonder why their uh, controller and their light are not communicating. And most of the time that's the reason why they've accidentally set an ID and not realized it. So we'll just leave that to off. And then if we go to number six, this has to do with our power scale. So right now um, in the menu, let's get out of here. On the main thing, you see one over one, half power, quarter power, and that's really easy to understand. Now, there are lights out there, for example, Profoto, you might have some older lights that you're used to the power scale being rated from like one to 10 or one to seven. So if we switch this value here and we'll just get back out, now you can see that it's on a power scale and this one is going from all the way off. So it's going from two all the way up to 10. So if you like that for some reason, I personally don't every other Godox product runs on the actual fraction scale there. It's a lot easier to understand, I find. But if you're used to it, you can change that in the menu really easily. So switch that back to off and we're back to function one. So those are the custom functions. Again, the speed mode and color stability mode being the most important. Other than that, you can fine tune it the way you want. So there you have it. That's everything you need to know about the Godox QT3 Studio strobes. Whether you go with the 400 watt second, the 600 or the 1200, they're all going to have the same features. Some of those new features include an extra stop on the low end for the power range. This goes all the way down to 1 256th of its power, giving you nine full stops of range, which is amazing. So you're not gonna have to use neutral density filters in the studio most times. It also has insane recycle speeds. At its minimum power, this 400 can shoot at 0.01 seconds. That's 20 frames a second that you can shoot this strobe at. Even at full power, it's still less than a second at 0.09 seconds recycling time. And in a studio strobe, that's really just unheard of. 
The other great feature we have on this is the new modeling lamp. That's a 40 watt LED. So gone are the days of the incandescent lamps that can break, get really hot. This is a very efficient uh, modeling lamp, which is really nice. We have the whole new design on the back. It still has high speed sync. And actually the flash durations are a lot lower as well. So you can freeze motion, even water droplets, smoke, whatever you're doing in the studio. It's really an amazing feature to have that. All that being said, it still fits right into the Godox system. So if you have other lights, speed lights, whatever you're using, the QT will fit with the controllers. So you could use the X2T, the X-Pro, or any future trigger that Godox releases is going to control this. You can put different groups, different channels, whatever you want. So all that being said, this is really the top of the line strobe, but it's not a top of the line price. You're gonna find it a lot less expensive than other industry players with all these features. And in fact, they can't even match all these features that the QT series has. So check out all the specs, all the different options, the kits that we have at Strobe Pro. And until next time, I'm Jesse and enjoy creating.